Hey everybody and welcome to Chew Stream where we talk about art and life as an artist. I'm your host Bobby Chu, and today's co-host is my wonderful friend and schoolism instructor Jonathan Hardesty. If you're an artist interested in a movie, gaming, animation, or art industry, look up Schoolism Newsletter and sign up. You'll get helpful free videos for artists, notifications of live streams like this, free tutorials and news from the Schoolism Newsletter. Have you ever felt too inexperienced or too young to be taking art seriously as a career? No matter what age, one thing I've learned over my 20 plus years as a professional artist, it's that knowledge is the key to opening doors to opportunity for everyone. So take one of the many courses on schoolism.com and see how top art professionals work and think. It comes with lessons and assignments to really help you learn and evolve your skills. Hey everybody, how you doing? And I have a special treat for you all today. I have... Uh, the workshop house, the lakes, uh, blah, blah, blah. The school is a lake house where we have, you know, four special artists that apply for the school is a lake house and stay there for 30 days nonstop. I can also see Noah on there. She's from Israel and she also attended the workshop house. Big shout out to Noah in the chat there. Um, Hi, Noah. But they <laughs> come from all over the world. We have Christophe from Belgium here. Can you say hi, Christoph? Hi. Awesome. And then we have Byron from Florida. Hello. And Fernanda and Carolina from Brazil. What's up, world? Hi there. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah, I figured, you know, it's such a special experience to be in the Schoolism Lake House. And how could we make it more special by kind of including you in today's stream so you guys can ask questions as well? And uh, so why don't we go to whoever has the first question from the Schoolism Lake House, and then we'll take turns from the audience to the Schoolism Lake House. Let's do it. Yeah, I have a question, actually. I'm always, like, in these two places where I cannot, I can't know where, where do I go. Like, if I just commit to one thing and be super special specialist at one thing or just know it all and know all the grounds and not be like super uh, uh, expert in one thing i don't really know what what does the, the, the people want what does the the like like as an artist which one do when to 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 know where to go like when to do yeah. specialist and when to be like know it all and a little bit of all yeah yeah i i think bobby and i probably agree on this you can you can let me know what you think bobby but i i i think you know starting off at least at the beginning with something that you can really sink your teeth into and be very good at is a, a great way to start it doesn't mean you can't in you, you can't grow later and do different things i think you have to be really intentional about that later on i think you have to make sure that you keep growing and keep learning and things like that but uh, I think starting with uh, something that you're you can sort of master in a sense I, I think that's very helpful what, what do you think Bobby yeah you know it's like starting off at one thing at a time you know the the hedgehog there's like this term I don't know where it came from I forget but it's in my head and it's called the hedgehog concept and it's like um, what does that mean well the hedgehog it's tiny it's fragile has tiny little legs anything could pretty much eat it but it has one trick up its sleeve that it can't you know nobody can do it better kind of thing and it just kind of balls up to the point where whatever the normal thing that eats the hedgehog you know a lot of times it can't eat it or something because it's balled up right? right it's got that one really good trick and exactly. one really good trick can get you your first job I think the main thing is that there's so many, so many people out there, or just like we're much more connected now, that um, that it's harder to stand out. It's easier to connect with people, and yet because of that, everybody's connecting, and it's harder to stand out. So it's all about getting to the point where you're special at what you do well, and then when you get really, really good at that then you start to branch off into other things. You know, for example, I started off with character design. Um, it wasn't doing that well. When I was just saying, I'm a character designer, 
it wasn't going that well. Then I said, I do whimsical, fantastical creatures. And then my career really took off. And from there, it, you know, then Men in Black called and was like, can you work on Men in Black 3 with, with us? And then now it's Aliens, which is very similar to Creatures. And then after that, it was like some sort of like hor horrific kind of theme thing uh -huh. where uh -huh. now I can branch off into, you know, slightly more different kind of creatures and so on and so forth. You know what I mean? So it's like you, you tackle one thing at a time, make sure that you stand out in that thing before moving on to the next thing. I, I think the important part of it, too, is making sure that what you pick is actually a very natural choice. Don't pick it. I, I think it's fair to say that Bobby liked drawing creatures. It, it wasn't that he thought in his head, this is the most financially viable decision I can make or That's something true, like that. Yeah. You, you, you know, it was a natural uh, choice for him. It was a natural thing that he wanted to pursue. So I think find what you like and then specialize in that. Make sure you make sure it's something that's organic and natural for you, not something that you think other people would like or that, you know, maybe this is going to be my key to success. If you don't like painting it, then don't do it. Yeah. And I just want to give a big shout out to Claudia out there. She's in the stream as well. And she was... A former uh, schoolism lake house uh, well, workshop student as well. So big <laughs> shouts out. This is awesome. Now I want to go, you know, take some turns and everything. So we're going to go to a question from the chat room there. Noam asks, uh, when you need to give specific a specific a specific feeling to a drawing, say cheerful or gloomy. How do you organize your references in order to achieve the right scheme uh, for the drawing itself? When I use Google, I often find myself drowning in so much reference that I tend to lose focus and therefore the final piece tends to be less tight. How do you deal with that? Is there a specific way you could share with us? Um, I, I think for me, I would rather go to something like YouTube videos where I pause it, you know, because when you look up stuff on Google, other people are looking up stuff on Google too. And there's a lot of paintings out there where I look at it. I know the reference. I remember the reference <laughs> that because right. it, it's like one of the most more popular Google images. But when you freeze frame on like a YouTube video or something, you know, I would think about cool characters uh, from films or from TV shows or whatever and try to find it on YouTube, do a little screen grab from that and make that my reference. But I would also just uh, just copy it first, right? And just get all the kinks out, uh, answer all your questions about it, and then get rid of the reference and just start designing. You know, if you have a, a big problem of sticking too much to the reference, then that's what I would recommend. You got any thoughts, yeah. John? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that's, I think that's really good. I, you know, it's, I think you need to approach it maybe a little bit differently. Think about what you're going to do technique-wise, and this is what I talk about in my class a lot, towards the end of my class, utilizing technique to achieve what you want. So if you want a cheerful look to the painting, then you have to think about what that means. Does that mean the pose of the person? Does that mean that you use more colors? Does that mean that you bump your values up to a lighter value range because you want it to look a little bit more cheerful and innocent? You use softer edges, you know, that, those kinds of things. That will allow you to look up reference that people wouldn't normally look up like Bobby is mentioning. And also, well, you'll be more targeted at your reference. So if you say, okay, I want some, I want something to be a little bit more colorful to make it look more cheerful, right? Well, then you don't have to look up an image that, you, let's say that people, uh, there's a little girl that's running through a field and you want her to be cheerful. You don't need to look up a little girl in a field, ru you know, running to, to, to get the idea of cheerful colors. You can look up a party. You can look at people having a party. Okay, maybe I can throw some of those colors into this composition or maybe I can, you know, uh, look at the you know, colors or values of confetti or edges or, you know, I, I don't know. There's a number of different ways to kind of go about it. But I think if you if you get a handle on what you want to technique wise, what you want to alter and change or what you want to use to get that across, then you can look up references that will give you information about that particular 
uh, technical aspect, if that makes sense. Awesome. And uh, why don't we go back to the Schoolism Lake House students. So do you guys have another question? Uh, yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually a question about the beginning of Imaginism Studios. Like, how, how did you get started with the creation of the studio? What were like the first obstacles or how did you get your first clients when you actually had really didn't want to have a name for yourself yet? As, as, as a studio. Yeah, because, you know, we live in Toronto. Um, that's where home base is. And when we started, we were nobodies. Nobody knew us. Uh, so how did we start? Well, why did we start? Let's start off with that. Sometimes you have no choice. And sometimes the best thing for you is to have <laughs> no choice, you know. Right. So it, it was a little bit after 9-11. Um, I couldn't get a job. Or sorry, no, the, the, I went through that as well, but um, we started the studio maybe like three or four years after that. Uh, yeah, and it was just, I couldn't get a job, honestly. I, I couldn't get a job that I wanted. Why? Because I wanted to work on Hollywood movies, but from Toronto. <laughs> and this was at a time where uh, Facebook wasn't even around yet. This was before Facebook. You know, so how do you do that? Well, you got to start your own thing. And so I told my brother, Ben, my older brother, uh, my only brother, uh, <laughs> you know, you have money. I got some talent. Let's start a studio. There <laughs> you, you know, go. And, there you go. <laughs> and then he said, yeah. So, you know, I am f forever in debt to my brother. And Literally, then, right? <laughs> yeah. And then we, we also had to have a plan. We also had to have a plan. Like, how do you go from zero to something? Um, so our plan was this. Every, first of all, this, this, I feel, applies to everybody. If you have a disadvantage, there is an advantage in there somewhere. So what was our disadvantage? Well, we didn't have any jobs. And then I thought to myself, okay, let's flip it around. Our advantage is that we don't have any jobs. How's that an advantage? You know, I thought, well, artists that are really good, really awesome, working in the movie industry, they maybe they put out a book once a year, maybe, most likely once every two years or three years. We don't have a job, so we can put out a book every three months. And that was our goal, you know, to put out a new art book every three months and uh, that would all accumulate to this point where we go to San Diego Comic-Con. We have a little tiny table there and we display these four books, right? So by the time we got to San Diego Comic-Con, we had four books. And we That's put awesome. them out there with all these prints. It looked like we'd been around for a very long time. <laughs> That's awesome. Right? And so what's everybody in the film industry looking for? <laughs> um, something fresh and new right? Something fresh and new. So the first person that was really, really important that came by was this uh, African-American lady, mother, you know, uh, pushing her stroller with a little baby in, in the stroller and comes over and is looking at her stuff. And it's like, what is all this stuff? You know, where did you guys come from? How come I never heard of you? And instead <laughs> of saying we're new, we said, oh, it's because we're from Canada. And so they're like, oh, okay. She was like, okay. Well, do you do any work for any other people? Yeah, yeah. Thinking that maybe she has a flower shop that needs a logo or something. It just wasn't in my head. It just wasn't in my head. I'm sorry, you know. Um, but she was like, okay, let me give you my card. And I was like, okay, great. Gives me the card. And this card, it has a little icon of the earth. And it says universal across it. <laughs> you never know. You Her never title, know. creative director, which is like. That's crazy. You know, like the top, top, top position. You know, studio, city, universal street or something, number one. Like it was ridiculous. And then after that, it was DreamWorks came by, Disney came by, all these things. We had all these leads. We ended up working on some Disney stuff, uh, 
K designed Jake and the Neverland Pirates, this TV show that was quite popular a few years oh, ago. Oh, yeah. That's cool. I didn't know she did that. Yeah, and actually, the Jake was based off of her brother, Keith. Oh, no kidding. I got to tell my son that. He used to watch that all the time when he, when he was a little bit younger. Yeah, so in her head, Jake was Filipino. It's pretty cool. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And there you go. So, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think one of the key parts of the story mm -hmm. that gets that you have to move past quickly because we're talking here. But I think one of the key parts is he said we wanted to do a book every three months, and then he did it. And what you're not seeing is the insane amount of hours and nights up and frustration and all of that that came in, in that process. That's the key part I think is setting that goal, and then you know, well, number one, being smart about how you're approaching things, like you said, and turning it around to make it your strength, but also getting it done, getting the job done. Not just saying, I want to do this and then, you know, playing video games all day or something. You know, it's it's getting it done. That's very true. And I'll give uh you know the professionals out there a little tip. Make sure when you start something, you know how to get off that hamster wheel. You know, <laughs> once you start something, because especially once you get an audience, once you start building up a little bit of a fan base and things like that, all of a sudden these, these things might pop up, a YouTube channel, a Patreon, a Twitch, or, you know, daily drawings, things like that. And make sure if you're going to stay on that you really understand that you are staying on there for a very long time. And right. if you are not planning on doing this forever, think about how you're going to get off that hamster wheel. Smart. Smart. That's something that people don't think about when they first start drawing or painting because they're not thinking, they're just trying to be successful in some way, shape or form. But actually that kind of, that success can be sometimes be a trap that yeah. locks you in to, you know, if I, if I painted a unicorn, a little baby unicorn, and everyone loved it, and I put it up, and I got all these hits, and I said, I'll do another one. All of a sudden, six months down the road, I'm a baby unicorn painter, which wouldn't be so bad, but you know, you know, if you don't like that, then you, you're, you, can, you can end up being stuck like that. And if you like it, that's fine, but if you don't like it, you're, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Well, the other thing is, it's like, you know, you start too many of these things, the other stuff that was working starts to suffer. Right. Because you don't have as much time. You don't have an, as much time and effort to put into it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That was so, a good answer. Bobby, that was a really good answer. Thanks, Overall. Brady. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's go on to the next question. So Runek asks, uh, what artist did you look up to and do master studies of when you were just starting your artistic journey? John? Mm. Well, I started in you know, the fine art world in the atelier world. So I actually, I think the first master copy I did was my teacher's, one of my teacher's drawings, uh, Hans, uh, Shamite and Sanatomak. I did one of their drawings. I think that was the very first one. But after that, I, I started, you know, building up a library of different artists that I like, and I, I would try to dissect what they were doing and try to get inside their heads. And that, I, I think primarily it was Sargent, uh, John Singer Sargent up front and Fetchin and, and many a lot of people don't know I don't know how you say his last name but it's Lawrence Al Alma it's Tadema or Tadema or Tadema I think it's Tadema or something like that but he's phenomenal and he's done some amazing paintings I looked at him a lot I looked at Waterhouse and then I on the digital side and on the illustration side I absolutely loved N.C. Wyeth Craig Mullins Land Decker uh, I mean, there, there's so many, I, I, yeah, I don't even know. I mean, Cornwell, Dean Cornwell is, is still one of my absolute favorites. So I would do copies of all those and Bridgman. I would, I would do copies of Bridgman and Loomis cause that's what you did back then. At least when I started, everybody was copy Loomis, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so I did those things, but, uh, yeah, it was mostly for me at first copying things to, to uh, try to absorb the technique. Was that the way it was for you, Bobby? Uh, well, sh Runak is saying in the very beginning of my artistic journey, in the, in the very beginning, I feel like I was going the wrong way. Um, mm. Master studies of Garfield, <laughs> of like the Simpsons. Uh, you know, it's a. Hey, you got to start there. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I did, you know, who I loved to copy when I was a, a little kid was uh, Mort Drucker, Jack Davis, Mad Magazine Legends. Right. Those guys know where it's at. That was really good. Um, painting wise, I feel like I really. I don't even know who I really studied in the very beginning. I think I was studying more drawers uh, mm-hmm. in the beginning. Peter DeSev, Stephen Silver in college, Claire Wendling in college. Mm. Even though I, I don't feel like I studied enough of Claire's stuff. Her, her stuff is just so beyond. Um, but yeah, those are... Oh, that's a whole list of some pretty good ones. It's hard. I know it's hard to narrow it down. It's true. <laughs> yeah, who are you kind of looking at nowadays, John? Ooh, I, the great part nowadays is that um, you know you can. I, I feel like every time I log on and go to Instagram or something like that, it's uh, there's a new artist. You know, uh, I I uh, I really like. Somebody that people wouldn't expect, but I, I have looked at just the other day, a couple of days ago, was Tyson Murphy. And I think, I don't know if you if you know him, Bobby, but he, he worked for Blizzard. And then I think he works now for um, League of Legends, like that company that, that Riot. you know, owns League of Legends. But mm-hmm. um, but he he has such an efficient way of working. And I saw uh, some, some pieces of his art, and I just thought it was really interesting because I, I was... Uh, I was really intrigued by the way that he worked and and how controlled it was and how simplified it was. That's what really made an impact on me. And um, I like uh, Piotr Yablonski. Is that how you say his name? I, I think that's how you say his name. It's uh, uh, it, I'm probably butchering it really bad. He's phenomenal. I just found him recently. And to be honest, on my Twitch stream, everybody mentions different things, and I start looking up these artists, and and they're amazing. You know, and, and, I mean. A lot of the fine art guys, Jeremy Lipking, Richard Schmid, they're my constant go-tos as well. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's, man, Gregor Rutkowski, you know Gregor Rutkowski? Uh, um, just artists that are working now that I think are super inspiring. Of course, Bobby, too. I get oh. tons of inspiration from Bobby. <laughs> I always say that, but we have to keep the bromance going, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, there's a lot. And, and that's the really cool part for me is literally I can jump on Instagram and be completely inspired by something really interesting, very well executed, and it, it's a new era for that. You'd, you usually would have to travel long distances a long time ago you, to get there and and find those kinds of things. But it's it's amazing. And then they'll have a demo. They'll say, "This is how I do it," and have a demo like on Schoolism. You can see that. So it's it's fantastic. Yeah, I've I've been really liking um, Sergey Kolozov stuff again yes really getting into that stuff uh dude is awesome all right so why don't we go back to schoolism lake house does anybody have another question yeah oh sorry okay sorry uh so uh how it's a very simple question but still it it is it, it's sticks in my mind, you know, how do you uh, deal with the competition and remain in the top? Because part of your, great part of your audience or your target public is our illustrators and they are like studying, setting up their own studios and I mean, when you come up with a new job, a new work, beautiful work, um, are you afraid of, uh, I don't know, someone Stealing your idea because there are so many artists right now, you know, and they are all showing more, you know, because of Instagram and social media and all. I don't know. How, how do you deal with that in a professional way? <laughs> well, there is only one Fernanda, you know, <laughs> there is only you're unique. And so the canned answer is um, everybody's on their own journey. There is no competition, but let's get real. That's not going to do everybody. Uh, that's not going to satisfy everybody. So the other thing about that is when I start thinking about my style and the things I want to do, I want to base it off of a lot of knowledge, a lot of fundamentals, a lot of knowledge. So it becomes harder for people to do what I do. That's 
that was my thoughts. Yeah, I mean, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, in terms of people stealing things and, and all of that, I think the fact that there's so many people out there is actually a benefit now. I think you, I've talked to people and they said, I, I want to put watermarks all over my paintings and I want to do this and that to keep it safe. But I think, ironically, the the way to keep it safe is actually to be more more well known. The more well known you are, the the easier it is to keep your images safe. Because if you guys have ever seen an artist online copy someone else's work, they pretty much are burned at the stake online. Well Everyone that well known knows known that are. art, someone will find it. I mean, I, I saw one person that copied. I can't remember who it was, but they they copied someone else's work, and a, it, within a day. Someone had made an animated GIF showing their work over top of the other artists, and and every studio saw it, every place, you know. And a studio is not going to want to work with someone like that because they're a liability, they're a legal liability. So, I, I think actually the the trick with that, with people stealing your work and things like that, is just making sure that that y you don't put out high res versions of everything. I mean, you're not you don't want to be dumb about it, but but make sure that everybody knows your work that you're that you have a presence because people will i would notice if someone stole bobby's work i would notice and i would write him right away and and say this person took your work you need to you know take care of this or whatever and it, it would be taken care of very quickly so i think it's a it's a double edged sword i think people can steal it easier but i i think it's i think it's a little bit harder for them to get a get away with it now i don't know you know uh when you're talking about that i was just thinking it's funny because as time progresses and as I keep consistent with posting stuff or streaming or whatever, uh, being out there, there's been so many more people asking me, oh, did I design that, you know, did I design that thing? Did I work on that film? You know, and they expect like, yeah, uh, for me to say yes. You know, like uh, <laughs> there's this the new star wars trailer chewbacca has a little guy a little friend you know and a bunch of people ask me was that yours you know <laughs> i love that fact because it made me like uh it made me realize i the goal that, that i was going for in the very beginning wasn't really a style it was more a subject right if i could make people identify my art with a whole subject like creepy cute you know creepy cute creatures if you see uh, one on tv i guarantee you i got like at least 20 emails that was like did you work on that <laughs> that's awesome which is great great you know because when people are making a film and they got something that's like creepy cute or something they would think of me yeah did you did you do the character on chewbacca <laughs> no, I didn't. I would have loved to. That that looked like something I would totally do just for kicks. Let's say this then. Let's say that the person that did that character was inspired by you. Nah. nah Let's nah. say that. <laughs> I think more than I anything, I was just really good at marketing myself in that category, so people ask, <laughs> you know. <laughs> now that's that is that is amazing. And see, that's the oh. thing. There's a number of ways that you can stand out, and, and that's one way that Bobby stands out. And, and it, it, it isn't something that's forced. It's what he's liked. And he's also done the creepy cute, as he said, very, very well. He's done that very well. So that's why people say, did you work on this? Did you do this? Because something else that's done well, they think, man, that has to be Bobby. And so, it, was, it was a little bit forced. It was like a very conscious thing that I was doing. Right. You know, uh, there right. is strategy to it. Like when sure. something hits, keep poking at that thing. Why, you know, keep expanding it. Why right. did people like it? Like uh, I got these little plant people videos in, in a lot of my YouTube videos or whatever, little plant people that run around right. and, and like give yeah. advice or whatever. Yeah, it was just because it, people kept commenting about it. So I was <laughs> like, okay, I'll give them a little bit more and see what this thing's all about. I do like those guys. Thanks. Like <laughs> Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, so next question here, values. How much time do you spend in your learning days 
sorry. How much time do you spend to understand values? Any exercise to make them easier to understand? This well, is probably a John question right here. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to give you a, a shameless little plug here. I mean, you're in the schoolism, you know, student group, so I don't have to I don't have to say this too much, but I do cover this pretty pretty extensively in my class, but it's a passion of mine values are I think you have to first understand how to turn them into a system that you can understand. There's a number of different ways to do that. I I talk about a five value system in my class, but I think once you understand how to break it down, how to simplify what you're seeing, then you can begin to tear it apart and understand it. And then, you know, you put it back together in a different way on an image sometimes if you want to modify things and, and all of that. But I, I spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about values. And even this right here was an interesting, this painting that's, that's playing right now, it, this was an interesting study in values because she had, this is my daughter Pippin. She was, I took this picture the other day and, uh, and it was so cute. I said, I have to paint this, but <laughs> the expression was great. And, and, but the lighting was interesting because she has very, very light values on her skin and in her hair, but the shadows are very, very dark in her eyes like that. So this was kind of an experiment for me in making those values work with the surrounding values. And later on in the, in the painting, you'll see me, I lighten the values just this, just a smidge at the end because I want them to, to group up more closely, but it had to do with, I, there were other factors that I was considering too, about making it work with the edges and getting the transitions to work and all that. But I'm always thinking about values, but I think the key is breaking it down and simplifying it and then finding exercises that allow you to do that, that allow you to simplify it, break it down. Cause that's going to allow you to understand it. If you can understand it and, and, create sort of a system out of the values that you're seeing and, and what you're practicing, then you're going to be able to duplicate that in a number of different ways. So I think the key is not necessarily how much time you spend, but I think it's about the way that you approach it. You want to be smart about how you approach the study of values, if that, if that makes sense. I, you want to add to that, Bobby? Yeah. Uh, Essentials of Realism is the class that John is talking yeah. about. Uh, it really teaches you all the essentials that make something feel realistic. And from there, you can pretty much go anywhere. Um, so that's number one. But the bigger picture here is that I was saying earlier, when I graduated you know, college and everything, when I was starting the studio, I couldn't get a job. So I sought out artists, great artists that I knew of. I only knew of their names to teach, to teach me. And when I didn't have money, because I didn't have money, I was like, you know, I'm going to start up this online school because there was no online school back then. And I will, you know, you teach on the school and, uh, and you can watch my class and stuff, but I'll watch your class to make sure it's okay. Right. You know, and, and, uh, in quotes, right. To make sure it's okay. In quotes. Yeah. And just kept getting like when that worked, you know, I got Steven Silver on there, uh, which was, like I said, when I was in college, I studied Steven Silver. You know, now he's one of my best buds. And it's amazing like that. But that's what happened. And then I studied from him, then Jason Seiler, then all these people. I watched your class, John. And that's how you get really good, really fast. Because the stuff that John teaches in his class has taken him, like, how many years to develop, you know, like, over a decade, you know, right. to develop. And yet you can learn all of this in a matter of weeks. It's like steroids for your brain. Somebody has <laughs> yeah, filtered and it out. It is addictive. I will say it is addictive too. <laughs> yeah. When you take a good class, you know, any whatever teacher, everybody's experienced this when they have a really good teacher, a really good class, you feel like you're gaining superpowers. Right. You know what I mean? It's true. It's true. Yeah. It's true. I was learning from Carcamo, master watercolorist, uh, Brazilian, by the way, because we got two uh, Brazilians in the house right now. Master uh, watercolorist taught us for two days, and I, I was just electrified with excitement and just so like jealous. so into watercolor now. It's awesome. That's really cool. I'm really jealous. I wish I was there. <laughs> I know well, you got a class coming though, right? Yeah, we filmed the whole entire thing. We brought him in. Oh, so good. 
Yeah, so this is my this is how I work, right? This is how my thinking works. It's like, oh yeah, I'm I'm gonna bring you in. You're going to teach this class. We're gonna record the whole entire thing. And of course, you're gonna need people to teach. So then who is he teaching? He's teaching Kay and I <laughs> and Masay, the three artists in the studio, right? So we get to learn from him for free, but also he's gonna you know, be making money because of his class and everything, everybody wins. That's right. Right? So, yeah. Now you get more of an idea of my, my kind of thinking. You know, I'm very uh, resourceful, I think. And just to, just to throw this out, too, I know we, we often get a lot of questions about people that are in other countries and they're asking about how to break out and how to, you know, uh, get clients in other countries and things like that. And I think it's really interesting that he doesn't even speak English fully, right, Bobby? He doesn't speak English fully. Yeah. He, so he, yeah, he, yeah. Oh, he doesn't yeah, really ahead, speak English uh, that much at all. So right. we had to get a translator. Right. And, and so, you know, it's one of those things where people always ask, how do, how do I break in and how do I do that? He's amazing. So even someone who doesn't speak English is now recording a video for mostly English-speaking audiences – and so I, I think that's just a testament to the power of just being good and, and working very hard to be very good at your craft and, and what that will yield you. I, you know, people always ask about that, and I, I think that is a good time to kind of inspire people and just let them know if you're really good, the work will find you. You'll eventually, by working hard, you'll, you'll get there. You know, one of the things I constantly tell uh, students especially is – uh, some advice I would have given to myself as a beginner artist, which is dream big, dream right. real big. When I first knew of Carcamo stuff, this is like probably around 10 years ago, first mm. got to know his stuff and it blew my mind. And then I realized, oh, I can't communicate with him. He doesn't speak English very well right now, you know, and did I give up? No. I just put it on the shelf. I will get to this person somehow, some way, someday. Right. If I got to <laughs> learn per Portuguese, I will right. freaking learn it <laughs> just so I can communicate it's worth with it. Right? This. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's, I feel like uh, that's something that everybody can do because it's just a decision that you make. Oh. You know, you can either give up or you can just go, okay. I don't know it right now. I'm going to keep it on the back burner. I'll come back to it every once in a while, poke at it a little bit, see if I could figure it out. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Even like Ian McKegg, right? Like one of my ultimate, ultimate artists that I would love to teach on schoolism. <laughs> you know, I got to know him. He was going to do a class. It's been taking forever. Am I giving up? Heck no. <laughs> I'm still not giving up. We're planning on flying him out here to Toronto to teach us again, just like Carcamo, next year, and then record the whole entire thing and all that stuff and make it into a class. That's great. He's phenomenal. Oh. I saw his work at a, uh, a sort of a retro illustration retrospective, and I was blown away for a number of reasons, but yeah, that's going to be great. Yeah. Matthew Abe Smith is saying, being stubborn can be helpful. Yeah. Yes. It definitely can. But then when do you know when to give up on it? That's something that I wonder about. Like, you know, you're going in this one direction. Is it the right direction? It's a tough road. When do you know to actually give up on it? I don't know because I just don't give up. That's, <laughs> I was just going to say, I'm the worst person to ask. Because yeah. Exactly. I'm really, really oh. stubborn. And so, I mean, I stood in front of my in-laws and told them, I said, I think I want to be an artist when I was 22 or 23. I was married for about two years. Oh. And they said, oh, you want to be a graphic artist? I said, no, I think I want to be a fine oh. artist. I mean, imagine telling, you know, some oh. of that. And I'm, yeah, I'm going to provide for your daughter with this. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, have you ever done it? No, never done it. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where everyone thought I was nuts at first. Everybody thought I was nuts. And I actually had a friend of mine say to me, it's funny because I don't make tons of money and things like that, but I love my life the way that I live. I love the, the quality of my life. And and my friend said, man, you, you're you're living the dream. I said, you got it right. I said, 
a lot of people don't feel that way because I'm not driving a Lamborghini or I'm not, you know, whatever, whatever people think is, is the measure of, of things. But I don't care at all about that. I, I, I get up every day and I do exactly what I want to do. I love it. I love everything I'm doing and my family's close by. I'm, I'm, I don't have to drive anywhere. It's, you get it's to fantastic. see your kids grow up. Oh my gosh. That is, that's, that, that is truly priceless. Oh, it is. It is. You know, and that was intentional. I will say when I sat down and tried to figure out what job would be, you know, the, the best job for me, I, I wanted something because when I was growing up, I could run in and out, you know, with my dad and say, Hey dad, you know, what, what are ventricles in the heart or something? And he would, he would stop his work and talk to me about it. And then I'd say, okay, I'll go back to, you know, going outside or I, I loved that. I loved having my dad near nearby. And so it's the same with my kids. They run in and out of my studio and they'll come in and say, look at this amazing rock I found dad, you know, or something like that. So it, it's cool. I, I love it. Absolutely love it. Same reason why I stayed because of family. But then a month later, my parents tell me, we're selling the house and we're retiring oh, no. in Taiwan. <laughs> oh, I was no. like, are you serious? Oh my gosh. But it's been great because I get to watch uh, my nieces grow up, which is oh, fantastic. Cool. Now, why don't we go back to the Schoolism Lake House uh, yes. for the next question. I have a question about color and um, I think it might make more sense to give you a little bit of background. Sure. I went to school um, and uh, went through a really kind of inadequate illustration program. And I basically had to teach myself. I wanted to be a digital artist. I had to teach myself. And I taught myself Photoshop. And learning how to use Photoshop really kind of happened concurrently and sometimes before actually learning the fundamentals of art itself. You know what I mean? It really kind of colored how I learned to make art. So my question really is, uh, what are your thoughts, your reflections, your suggestions on applying color and learning how to use color uh, within digital mediums like Photoshop? I feel like I see a lot of artists um, applying color, like using extra layers set to different blending modes and like making, you know, editing opacities to make sure that this, you know, type of yellow looks good on blue. I feel like I should be able to just kind of pick the right hue, the right color with the right values and everything from the color picker without having to, you know, go through the kind of elaborate process of, you know, calculating things. It feels kind of artificial, but that artificial method is kind of economic in terms of time, whereas <laughs> trying to like figure out what color, uh, oh, in, what individual color like applied directly, uh, that feels like it takes too much time and I get frustrated. I, 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 I'm, I, I just have these like mixed feelings of trying to go between the two. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I do. I do know what you mean. Do you want to, do you want me to do that or do you want to feel that Bobby? I, I think we could both feel this one. Um, like, first of all, technology is not the be all end all, you know, or else anybody that pushes the right buttons could work at ILM or something. You know, they <laughs> all know their fundamentals inside and out. Now, every kind of discipline of art has different kinds of fundamentals, like storyboarding will have different fundamentals than, say, painting in light and color and stuff like that, like the stuff that you want to do, Byron. Um, so first is to learn the fundamentals of light and color. And I, I would have to kind of go back to what John was saying. His class really does teach that, uh, the rules, how things work, and then how to design uh, reality. You know, how to design the kind of exposure in your painting or shifting hues and things like that. Uh, and somebody in the chat was saying that a really good pair is John's Essentials of Realism with Jonathan Hardesty and then the painting with light and color with Daisy Tsumi and Robert Kondo. Because yeah, they think yeah. about stuff in two totally separate ways, which is really nice. The more ways that you know how to do one thing, the more options you have, and actually the more of a unique style will start to appear, you know, because you're, you're learning so many different things. Yeah, I, I think really the, the question that you're asking, let, let's say you were a car builder that you built 
custom cars, somebody could tell you, this is how you weld this particular piece for this particular car. You just weld these things together and this will work for this car, right? And so you can think of that and say, okay, well, I just want to weld that piece. I don't really want to understand why I'm doing it. And, and, and you can get by with that. But if you want to be a custom car builder, you need to understand, well, is this structurally sound? Is this you know, going to work with the later stages of the car process? If you understand all of that, then you can modify and you can change and you can do whatever you want to it. You know, so I think, I think the, the question really comes down to, can you just color pick? Yeah. And sometimes is that the best thing to do? Yes. Sometimes if you're doing a graphic novel, you can't sit down with every cell of the graphic novel and pour over, you know, think like an impressionist and pour over the color and do 50 studies to try to figure out what, you know, you can't do that. Sometimes you have to color it in. You have to use a methodology and you have to get the job done. It depends on what you're doing. But I think overall, instead of approaching it in terms of, or thinking of it in terms like, I want to get something that's, you know, expedient and easy. And I know that's not what you mean. You don't just want to take the easy route. But but I think there are things that work. But I think understanding how things work then allows you to unpack it, to make different decisions, to make interesting decisions. Because if you don't understand how anything works, you you will be stuck in a repetitious sort of pattern where you will make the same decisions over and over. And actually, it's funny that you mentioned that Tonko House class, Bobby, because I was I was before you even said that in my response, I was going to say it because they the, the big thing that they start off with is about observation. And they spend so much time observing color and observing light from reality even if they're working digitally, they're working digitally. You know, you don't have to work in oils. I, I would never say that somebody needs to work in oils to work digitally, you know, or something like that. That doesn't make any sense. But, but the tools you need to learn, the tools you need to be really familiar with digital, and it's a, its own it's its own medium. But I think their class is a testament to what, and their work is a testament to what observation and careful observation over a long period of time can really do because they handle color beautifully and wonderfully. And Nathan Falx is another example of somebody who handles color amazingly. Well, he's got 15,000 small thumbnails in gouache that he's done from <laughs> life. He, he, I mean, literally, he probably has 15,000. I'm not, I'm not even oh, joking. Probably yeah. 10 to 15,000, which is insane to think about. Okay, let's say if it takes you 15 minutes each one. I don't even want to do the math. But, but, you know, those are the people who are amazing with color. And it comes from an understanding, not just an understanding of the science of it, this wavelength, that wavelength, but it's a practical understanding that's gained from years of observation. No, but so you know I, what? Sorry. Like uh, before, oh, I just want to add, when you're doing a whole bunch of paintings, yeah, you're going to learn a lot. When you're doing a whole bunch of paintings as a result of taking a whole bunch of different classes, hearing right. how different you know, very yeah. high level artists think about these things, then you're learning on steroids. Exactly. Exactly. Then you have a targeted way of approaching it. Then it's not yes. just you figuring it all out again on your own when other people are passing on knowledge where they've really largely figured out a lot of at least certain aspects of certain things. They have figured it out. And so I, I think I think actually it's interesting because I remember Bobby, you were talking about Photoshop was was saying, their Photoshop is almost leaning that direction where they want people. I think you were talking with Craig Mullins when when they said that they they almost want people to to have a button where it's like I just want to create an environment and here's my button to mm -hmm. they they you know they they would like to have that but I don't think that'll ever happen because I think anything interesting is going to come out of the knowledge and I think what's once something becomes standard nobody's going to really care about it. And uh, I think, uh, I, I don't know, I, I think uh, approaching it in terms of, you know, breaking it apart and understanding it, learning it, that's the longer way to go about things. Uh, you have to take some classes, you have to practice, you have to do all that. But I think that's the better way because that's going to give you a richer, more full understanding than, mm. than just having the repetitive surface uh, methodology. Yeah, that, and to that, add one so. little last piece of this... Yeah. It, you know, nowadays, when we have a question, we go straight to Google most of the time, and we just look up the answer. Right. One of the best things for me when I was developing as an artist was that I didn't have the internet. I had to figure <laughs> out stuff on my own. So even though I am saying to learn from all these people, still, 
I I reserve it's if I had to put into ratios, I learn from people seventy percent of the time, whatever awesome lessons I can get, and then I reserve about thirty, you know, twenty five thirty percent of the time where I'm trying to figure out new stuff on my own, just sitting there and thinking right. about it. You know, don't always go to Google that quick right. for yeah. whatever answer. And it's and if you if you know something, let's say you know about botany or something like that, all you have to do is Google something very quickly. And if it's if it's a topic that you know something about, you'll realize very quickly, okay, yes, the internet is full of misinformation. And so when we Google everything or have that methodology or that that way of working where we just we look for those quick answers, most of the time they're wrong. Or slightly misinformed. What well, you know? What this is also what happens though. It's like one person comes up with their answer. It's not like the be all end all universal right. answer, but they come up with an answer, and then somebody else builds on top of that answer. So like oil, oh, figured something out, made gasoline, and then somebody built on top of that. Let's make a car. Let's right. make an assembly line. And then all of a sudden, people keep building on top of an answer that was probably wrong to begin with. And then right. they keep going till we have a million cars, a, you know, billions of cars polluting the whole entire earth. And if one person just sat there and just thought about it a bit more, maybe things would have changed. You yeah, know? you know, I actually, I actually saw that there was an electric car. I saw it on Jay Leno's garage. There was an electric car, uh, like around uh, around the time of Tesla. It was like early 1900s or late 1800s. Yeah, yeah. there were as many electric cars as steam powered cars and yeah, gas crazy. powered cars. It had this like literally, you just went in and you had this like rod that it, it was made. It was marketed for women like going shopping. No steering wheel. Yeah, yeah, I know the one you're was, talking about. Yeah, it was crazy. I couldn't believe that. I could. I I, I totally couldn't couldn't believe it. And so. Uh, yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, it's it's interesting. It's very interesting to think about that. Yeah, thank goodness yeah. for you know people like uh, Elon Musk and these kind of people that are pushing. They they just go, no, I'm gonna go in this complete other direction because that's what makes sense to me instead of just accepting how you know the direction of things. Mazda actually produced an engine. Uh, it's called a rotary engine. Have you heard about that, Bobby? And it doesn't have pistons like, you know, a, a normal engine uh, does. It's actually like a triangle that that turns in. It's kind of like a. It, it it's it just looks like it's a reinvented very the wheel. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know that's like, but it's it's so funny because it, people always knock it because the like there's problems with it. But I think if they would have pursued that engine as opposed to the the piston engine, if they would have actually taken that and worked out the kinks, I think it would be. It'd be smaller. It'd be uh, yeah. it'd be more efficient. I think eventually. So it's funny, but but people they they want the the the, the piston engine, you know, <laughs> like you said. <laughs> it's very very interesting. Anyways, let's steer this right yeah. back into yes, art. Let's go back, and uh, <laughs> maybe we can ask the schools in my house uh, if you guys have any other questions. Do you guys? I I have a um, a question. It's regarding. Copyright, but not in the competition way anymore. <laughs> I mean, you mentioned, okay, go on, I don't know, the movie, Netflix, pause, draw something from there. Okay, I can, we can do that, and then we fall in love with this piece of work, and then we want to post it. We want to sell this idea, not the print itself, but the, the idea. How does it work? Can, I don't know, Netflix, uh, find out, don't like it, you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> like if you I do mean, a study, is that what you're talking about, Fernanda? Uh, yeah, yeah, I study, but then you, you really like the, the final piece, you know? And, I don't know, you want to sell the, the idea that you can, like, I don't know, uh, draw from movies, draw from other characters, like cartoon stuff, you know, fun stuff. There are a lot of those in, in the internet and there is a discussion about copyright. You cannot do that, you can do that because it was you, the person who drew it. You know, does that offend any kind of law? Well, if you're... Uh, um, can we do that? You can't sell the, the 
painting of um, of a study from a film. I, yeah, I wouldn't. It's like posting. But people do. I see it all the time at like comic cons yeah. and stuff, <laughs> fan <laughs> That's art. That's true. You know, people it's will true. still do that. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> but um, I'll give you some guidelines, okay? These are some guidelines for uh, copyrighted material. It is a bit of a gray area, okay? For the most part, works of like uh, commentary or if you're criticizing whatever it is that you're showing, um, it's for research or teaching. Most of the time, that's considered to be fair use or some countries, they call it fair dealing. You know, mm -hmm. things that are also most likely considered fair use, okay, is if you use whatever it is, you know, the reference, in a transformative way, okay? So you're taking an image and adding to it so that the meaning has changed, okay? Right, it's kind of like Weird Al in music. If you know Weird Al, like he changes the words and cha he plays the same kind of song, but he changes the words and changes the meaning of the song and the feel of it. Yeah, that I, I'm not exactly positive about that because, well, he's had problems with uh, Prince trying to translate one of his songs. Um, Prince didn't give him the OK and he didn't do it. You know, so oh, yeah. this he, is gray he, area. You know, yeah, this is like yeah. if if it's a giant company that really wants to just twist your head off, they will probably still come after you, you know, yeah, but for the right. most part, for the most part. Okay. So the other thing is if it's like real footage, like home videos or news, that's better than fictional works. Okay. If the amount of footage or the image used is, is a lot or a little, you know, so if, if say you're, your whole entire image, it's an amalgamation of like 20 different images versus you have this big Jim Lee right. comic drawing right in the middle. And, you know, and, and it's very much when you look at it, it's very much about this Jim Lee drawing that you copied, you know. And the last thing is if what you did uh, will not harm the the copyright owner's ability to profit from their original work, then it's most likely to be fair use as well. I see. Yeah, yeah. very thorough answer, I think. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I, That's a I very think important is, topic. I, I think this is probably uh, like why you want to understand what you're seeing in term and use your references for more understanding what's happening and not not feel like you need to copy them exactly. I think that's really a key part of it is being able to understand what you see and then and then use that information in your in a different way i think that's the safer way of course to to go about things you you the the more you more closely you stick to that reference the more in danger you you <laughs> you make you know yourself when you're when you're doing it for for profit or things like that especially now did you guys have any last questions we could take one more question Uh, actually, it's a, a kind of a question about schoolism. Um, since I'm heavily influenced and have a great love for comic book art, I was just wondering if in the future there was going to be... Uh... Hello? Oh, I think we lost them. Did we lose them? And the last two... That's yeah. more directed for, like, for example, the old course of Alabama. Sorry, um, I think you'll have to repeat your question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. We lost yeah, you. No um, it's, it's just a question uh, if uh, there's going to be any, if there are any plans in the future to have some content on schoolism, uh, the website, or maybe at schoolism like workshops. Uh, that are more directed towards the comic book artists, like for example, the old course of Alvin Lee. Ah, uh, yes, I would love I actually, to. That that one's I, a tough one. I actually, there's that reminds me, Bobby. There's there is something. I'll make this mysterious, but there is something that I, I wanted to with that in mind that I wanted to <laughs> talk to you about. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I uh, normally Bobby's the one that knows everybody. 
but I do know someone who's fairly high profile colorist in the comic art world. And so I, I, I wanted to maybe make the introduction. So I don't know. Well, maybe <laughs> let's talk after the uh, stream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I would love to. One of the tough things is, you know, I don't want just anybody to teach comic books. I want somebody that's like really up there and just awesome. Most of the time, uh, you know, comic books, it, it takes up so much time. These comic book artists, they are like the hardest working types of artists out there. I don't know if I've yeah. even, if I know of anybody that works harder than them. You know, to do one page a day, it might take them like 12, 14 hours. And this is like, okay, you're finished one book. Okay, well, next month there's another book. Right. And it's just nonstop. So it's something that I really want to do. But um, gotta gotta find the right person. I may have the right person. We'll see. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. You know, to the audience, uh, writing in and everything uh, for the questions, and of course, our Schoolism House artist there at the Schoolism Lake House, Christoph, Byron, uh, Fernanda, and Carolina. Thank you so much for all your questions. And the biggest thank you goes to my buddy, John. Thank you very much for your time. I know it's precious. Um, yeah, and, and I look forward to the next time we do a stream. Love these. I'm up for it anytime, man. Awesome. Take care, everybody. See you guys. Great questions. Now, if you live in an environment where it's way too hard to buckle down to get into your art and there's just way too many distractions and you really, really want to get intense about learning and improving, I highly recommend applying for the Schoolism House. It's a house that we have just outside of Montreal, Canada in St. Julien. It's a big house with a lake in the back and only four artists are accepted at one time to live in this house for a 30-day intense workshop where you would actually be living with your mentor Thierry LaFontaine so not only are you eating drinking sleeping breathing art every day all day 30 days straight but you're also living with your mentor to see him struggle through his projects to see him stay up at night to see him when he wakes up and things like that the perfect environment to get supercharged not only that but this house attracts the hungriest of the hungriest artists out there. So you would be living with three other artists from around the world to push you towards your dreams, to push each other in this awesome environment where there is nothing to think about except for art. And towards the end of your stay, we fly in a guest artist. Sometimes it's me, sometimes it's somebody else. You know, and there's been Nathan Fowkes there, there's been Steven Silver there, Sam Nielsen, John Hardesty, tons of amazing artists, and they would stay there with you for a few days, living with you as well. So not just teaching you art, but breaking bread with you and just living with you so that you can get the ultimate, ultimate experience with the perfect artistic environment around you. You can sign up right here. See if you get in, see what happens, because it's an amazing experience. All right, everybody, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you guys next time. Subscribe to this channel, and then press the notification button so you won't miss out on new videos, tutorials, interviews, and other news slash advice for artists. If you like this channel, share it with the artists in your life. Thanks for watching.